right. I believe we're live. Um, if anybody's out there, good to see you. So we got a couple of people in the chat already. Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, glad you're all here. Um, yeah, so today we're going to do some, uh, some Rust programming um, and also learn a lot about uh, the Game Boy. Um, I'm curious uh, in the chat if people can just kind of write out um, why they're here, if it's more uh, Rust focused, if it's more uh, Game Boy focused, if you're here like Frank is just to support me. Thank you, Frank. Uh, then, then let me know as well. <laughs> and um, then we can kind of fine tune the, the stream to the, the needs of the chat. Um, so my plan basically for, for today is, uh, is to go through the project that I already have. Um, it's Game Boy Emulator written in Rust. Um, and it's about, I'd say, I don't know, 40 to 50% done. Um, we're going to kind of go through it, take a look at it, um, understand the code base as it exists right now, get a feel for what's missing. Um, and, uh, I haven't actually run the project in a few months now, so, um, it'll be fun to see, you know, maybe we need to update some things and things like that. Um, but, uh. We're going to go ahead and try that and then we'll see how far we get. I think we'll probably stream for about two hours or so and, uh, and see what we can get done in that time. So, um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to stop me. Um, and I, I can go in depth on things. The point of this is not for me to like get as much done as possible code wise, but really to, um, see what people are interested in and, and to, um, teach people about, uh, about emulation and about Rust. So I'm gonna to switch to the desktop here um, and we'll get started. Um, so the project as it stands, you can find uh, here on my GitHub. Um, it's github.com slash rylev slash dmg01. And we can see already we got one thing to do. We got a security alert, so that's good. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, you can check out the code here, run it yourself. Um, I think the README probably could use some love as well um, because it's not very intuitive for how we get this thing running. So um, basically we're ge generally just gonna get this cleaned up and stuff like that. Um, if you wanna follow along at home and stuff and you've never done Rust before, then I would uh, definitely recommend going to rustup.rs uh, and following the installer there so that you can install Rust and get, uh, get it used. Um, the, the project as it stands is actually kind of pool five or six parts. Um, the, the part that I really care about a lot and would love to see get better is the book. So I have a book uh, that I've started writing alongside of this thing. There are a lot of Game Boy emulators out there and this will by no means be the best one, the fastest one, the most accurate one. That's not the goal, but I hope it's the most well-documented one. Um, I hope that no one ever has to struggle with creating a Game Boy emulator ever again. If they wanna know how it works, they can just go ahead and read the book. Um, so that's the big part there. Um, there is the main kind of bones of the thing is this lib uh, dmg01 here. Uh, that's the main part of the Rust code that fuels most of the internals, uh, like the, the CPU, the, the, what I'm calling the GPU or the graphics part of, of the project, um, things like that. Um, and then there's a, a JS uh, kind of wrapper around that, and it's, JS is maybe the wrong term, um, but it's really a, a Rust wrapper that exposes a kind of WebAssembly um, compatible interface so that it can be used from JavaScript, um, but I don't think this project actually has any JavaScript in it. Um, and then DMG01 and DMG01.js are the kind of front ends that actually use the, the emulator and expose some kind of interface for people to actually run games on and, and play um, and have fun. Um, DMG01 is written in Rust and it's uh, basically just a, a window that you can run 
Um, should be cross-platform, so it should run on Windows. I've never tested it and should run on Linux, although I've never tested it, but it runs on Mac, or at least it did. So we'll see if it still does. Um, and then DMG one JS is a, is a JavaScript wrapper plus like a React front end. Um, and it has uh, the primitive pieces of a debugger in it as well. So we'll kind of, we'll take a look at that as well. Um, and yeah, that should be it. Uh, if anybody's curious why it's called DMG01, that was the code name, the working code name for the Game Boy when it was in development. I think it stands for dot matrix game because the screen is a, like a dot matrix uh, uh, kind of grid of pixels. Um, and that's, uh, I couldn't think of a better name. Um, so that's it. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions and then we're gonna kind of get, we're gonna dive into the code now. Um, I think we have, we have it here, yeah. So, so we're inside here, this matches everything that we've had before. Um, I think we'll we'll start with the um, with DMG01, which again is like the native window interface to this whole thing, um, and it doesn't have a README, or it does. It does have a README. Okay, so let's see what it says. Okay, um, yeah. So it's the desktop version of the emulator, um, and you run it by running cargo run, and then you have to pass it. I don't think you have to pass it. This is optional. You can pass it a boot ROM, and that is basically the piece of code that gets run automatically when the Game Boy starts up. And um, if, you're, if you've used the Game Boy before, you remember you turn it on and like the Game Boy logo scrolls and it goes da ding and then your game starts, like that's the boot ROM. The reason I don't include it automatically is because that is like copyrighted material from Nintendo. And so, uh, yeah, I think I don't want to get sued by Nintendo, so I didn't include it. But if you happen to have one, which I happen to have found one somewhere, I won't tell you where, <laughs> um, then you can put it there. I, um, I'm pretty sure I've already made it so that it doesn't need it. It will kind of set up the emulator properly um, and, uh, and do everything if you don't provide it. And then uh, you can pass a game ROM. And again, um, there are a lot of free game ROMs out there. Um, if you want to play something like uh, Zelda or Pokemon or Tetris or something like that, then you'll have to have your own copy. And again, I'm not going to tell you where to get them, but um, I'm sure you'll find them if you want them. Uh, and I happen to have a copy of, I believe, Tetris, um, which does not yet run on this. So we can, like, I think over the next couple of streams or whatever the goal, Basically, the goal is to get Tetris running, um, which shouldn't be too bad. Um, we're, we've come quite a long way. And the good news for all of you who are watching this is that um, I've done a lot of the like boring work, um, and we'll take a look at that really quickly um, so that we don't, don't have to go through it together. Um, cool. So let's, let me open this thing up in code, and we can take a look at it. Um, so... The DMG01 is basically one file. It's a main file. Um, and I think we won't go through it right now, like very in depth, um, because uh, it makes more sense for you to know the, the actual emulator library first and the API that it exposes before we really dive into how this works. But basically all it's doing is kind of getting your ROM file, getting your, um, getting your uh, boot ROM file, and then setting up a window and then kind of doing the timing. So as it stands right now, and this is maybe something we wanna change, but the, the actual emulator library doesn't know anything about timing of things. Um, that's all the responsibility of, uh, of the code outside of it. Um, I think we'll probably wanna change that at some point um, because I think it makes sense for it to know about timing. Um, but you know, basically can figure out how many cycles of the CPU needs to run per second and stuff like that. And, um, and then it does, does its thing. And really, um, let's see here. We can see CPU is coming from, from the library that we're gonna be looking at in a second. And we go through, and I think, where is it actually being called? Like, you can see here, like, uh, let's see. None of it's being called. Oh, here it is. Here's the so the step is basically saying go ahead and step one, um, one kind of um, 
one laps through the, the CPU. And then uh, we, we can also get a canvas buffer that actually should like, we can display to the screen. But like that's enough of that right now. I think the more important thing to do is look at the insides of that library because that's gonna be more descriptive of what's going on. Uh, and we want lib dmg01. We'll open that up in code. Cool. Um, so yeah, here's the, the main interface right here. It's pretty simple right now. Um, I have a feature on where you can serialize the CPU. This is for use inside of JavaScript. So we can like serialize the state of the CPU as JSON and send it over so we can inspect it and stuff like that in JavaScript. But um, as, if you don't have that feature on and it's not on by default, then you won't have that capability. And it exposes basically three things to you, a CPU, a GPU, and a memory bus. Um, and actually it's only publicly exposing the GPU right now. Um, we'll see if that changes in a little bit. Um, GPU is probably not the best term uh, for it um, because yeah, it's not really a GPU. Um, uh, I don't even think that the Game Boy had a separate physical graphics chip. Let's see if we can see Game Boy hardware. Let's see if we can take a look at the the actual picture of it. Um, yeah, I think this was it here, or no, that's a color one. Um, but yeah, like basically the GPU is uh, uh, is only taking care of uh, video related stuff, but look, we'll look at it in a little bit. Um, so let's see, by the way, if you want to know where to find all of this stuff. There's a ton of great documentation online, um, including, I'm hoping eventually, the book that goes along with this project. Um, I think, uh, you know, we'll go through and look at a lot of these, but there's a bunch of stuff um, online to kind of find out how uh, a Game Boy actually works. Um, we're gonna start inside of the CPU here. Um, can everybody see the the code all right, by the way? Is it a good size? Is it too big? Kind of seems pretty big to me. Maybe I do it like this. Chat, let me know what works for you. Um, cool, so it's a bunch of macros that we'll, we'll go over real quick, um, but we'll look at the, the struct here. So, so here is our, our CPU uh, struct right here. Um, and the CPU is pretty simple. Um, it has uh, registers. Um, and for those that don't know um, about how computers work at a, at a low level, basically your CPU has a bunch of little buckets inside of it that can hold a certain amount of data. Um, and those are typically called registers. And they're the kind of smallest and most close piece of memory, let's say, to, um, to the machine that you have. Um, and in the case of the, uh, of the Game Boy, there, it's pretty simple. Um, the Game Boy is an 8-bit machine, as a lot of things were back in the day. Um, and so it basically can hold in its registers 8 bits of information at a time. And in Rust, that's basically specified by this U8, meaning an unsigned 8-bit integer. Um, so it can hold numbers basically from 0 to 255. Um, and there is, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight registers there. Um, there's, they're really like, all of them are basically the same except for one of them. There's the F register um, called the flags register. And it is also really just an eight bit number, but because of the way that it's used, um, it's nicer to have a struct uh, associated with it. So it's a bit easier, um, but as we'll see, down here, um, we can also treat it as uh, as an 8-bit number as well. The flags register has a couple of bit flags, basically, um, on it. Um, and I've chosen to represent that here as Booleans. We could uh, eventually move this to using like the bit flags uh, crate, um, which allows you to, to do similar things um, and expose a struct basically as a, as a couple of bits. Um, and don't worry about what you know what the flags actually are right now. We'll we'll go through that um, at some point. 
Um, cool. So we have a CPU. It's got it's got like eight eight bit numbers associated with it. Then it has two 16 bit numbers associated with it. One is the PC or program counter, and that's basically a pointer into memory um, of the currently executing instruction. And so if the PC is set to zero, then basically we're going to look at memory at address zero and execute an instruction at that address, at address zero. And then it's going to increment the PC by some certain amount um, and then execute uh, the instruction at that new address. Uh, and of course, there are also instructions for manipulating the PC. There are things like jumps where you can say, well, actually I want the PC to just be this number instead. Um, and then the SP is a stack pointer, and we'll talk a little bit about the stack later on. Um, but if you're familiar with stacks and heaps um, or a stack data structure, then this should be familiar with you. It's basically pointing to where, um, where the stack actually is in memory. Um, yeah, and then we have a bus here basically for talking to, to memory. Um, and the memory bus has a bunch of uh, it's basically just a bunch of fixed size arrays in it. Um, and this is how I'm representing memory, basically. Um, and so you have things like where your, where your game ROM is sitting is in here. You have some um, like working RAM, basically. So RAM that the game can use whenever it needs some memory. Um, it's got things like uh, like object memory and objects in, in Game Boy are basically sprites. Um, uh, and, and basically then it has reference also to what I call the GPU. And this is basically just things where um, we have things like the video RAM, which is holding on to, to basically mappings um, uh, to graphics. And we'll talk, we'll talk explicitly how all this stuff works here. Um, so don't worry, like obviously it's a ton of code and we, we're not going very uh, deep in depth with it right now. But the important thing to remember is that um, Game Boy is pretty simple. Um, as you can see, like basically we have these structs and they're really wrapping just like 8-bit uh, integers, some booleans, um, maybe some fixed size arrays, um, but there's nothing crazy going on. There's There's no very complex data structures or anything like that. Like this, the, the Game Boy is extremely simple. Um, and uh, yeah, there's not really that much to it. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, you know what we can do right now is just go ahead and run the, the thing and see that it works. Um, so let's go back to this here and we can do cargo run. And then I have cheated um, and basically I have some ROMs here already. Um, so we'll pass in the boot ROM there. Um, and then I've also cheated and I have, um, we can try Tetris, but I can tell you right now it won't work because um, it never has. Um, but I have these also really nifty and useful CPU instruction uh, ROMs, which basically run tests. Um, on the CPU and verify that um, if you do a certain instruction, you get a certain result. And then if it if it doesn't do that, then it tells you, hey, this thing's not working. These are very useful for verifying how um, you know how accurate your Game Boy is. And I like there's simple ones like the ones I have here, which are just on CPU. But then they there are other ones that test timing and stuff like that, which um, we won't need for a while because we just want it like. That's only really useful if you are running some certain types of games or you really want to make a very accurate Game Boy, which at this point we're not really uh, interested in. Um, so I think we'll just try out, what's a good one here? Um, let's see, they're all going to fail. Like I think none of them pass. So I'll just pick this BitOps one and we'll run it. And it's got to compile all of this stuff here. Um, and basically we'll see that it will run the test really quickly and then it will show us like which things are failing. And eventually what we can do is try and make those things pass. And the, the unfortunate part is that I've done kind of all the easy work and now we're going to have to do some debugging. Um, 
Debugging when you don't have a debugger is really difficult. So we might want to go ahead and build the debugger actually first um, so that we have some kind of either command line or graphical utility that allows us to poke around in memory, set breakpoints, things like that. And we can verify that things are happening how we would expect them to happen. Um, if you don't have that, you're basically out of luck because you have no way really of um, verifying things. Oh, and you can see it's running. It's very small and I'm sorry, I can't really make it bigger. Um, we could change the code to do that. Um, and you can see here, these are all the instructions that are failing right now, which is a lot of them. Um, oh boy. It's even more than I thought it would be. In fact, it's so many that I think, is that even right? <laughs> but yeah, a lot of them have failed. So we're, we're not in a good position right now. Um, the good news is we are at a position where it shows the Nintendo logo, which is awesome. That's uh, That takes a while to get to. It's not very hard, but it takes a while to get to. And we can actually see which tests fail and stuff like that. So we're, we're getting there, um, but we're not quite there yet. We can close out here. Um, any questions so far from chat? Let me know how things are going over there. Um, anything else that you would like to see? Yeah, sorry about it being so small. Um, we can also make it bigger, but we'd have to write the code to actually do that. So um, right now, the way that it works uh, inside of there is it takes the memory, the raw memory from the, the raw buffer, basically the video buffer. Um, and uh, it basically takes that buffer and puts it into a window. Um, so one pixel of the Game Boy corresponds more or less to one pixel on my window. And I have a much higher resolution than the Game Boy was. So that's why it ends up small. And what we could do is do some mappings and it's not too hard, but we can map and say this one pixel in the Game Boy corresponds to four pixels on my screen. And that would effectively double the size of, um, uh, of the window that we see there. Um, we have a question, can't you debug with a Rust debugger? So we can debug our emulator, but our emulator is emulating a Game Boy and we can't debug then the Game Boy itself, if that makes sense. So we wanna build a debugger that basically understands how the Game Boy works. So we can look at, for instance, what the registers are, what things are in memory, um, things like that set breakpoints inside of our game. So not necessarily inside of our Rust code, but inside of the game itself and say, when, when the program counter that we saw before here, when this program counter is uh, 10,000, let's say, we want you to stop ex execution. Um, and of course you can, you can do that and a, and a debugger inside of your Rust code um, but it's much easier when you have a debugger that kind of is fully encapsulated and fully understands the, the Game Boy as a system. Does that make sense? Um, we can take a look at the start of what I've already written inside of a debugger and see if we, if it makes more sense that way. So inside of this DMG, DMG 01 JS here, um, I've already started like a debugger interface basically. So we can, let's go ahead and run it. And if we look at the readme, I think it says, yeah. So npm install, gonna run that real quick. So basically what this thing is doing is it takes that Rust code that we have, compiles it down to WebAssembly. Then we have this basically WebAssembly friendly interface crate that wraps our, our lib and exposes that out to JavaScript. And then there's a, a somewhat small JavaScript front end basically that's, and we could have written that in Rust. Um, although when I started this, like, uh, you know, interacting with the DOM in, uh, in WebAssembly through Rust was really not a fun experience. Um, it's gotten a lot better since then. Um, so I, I decided to do it in TypeScript instead. Uh, TypeScript, I think it was TypeScript, it might be just plain JavaScript. Um, and we have a vulnerability there um, that we'll, we'll fix in a little bit. Um, but 
we have this interface basically that that we can um, interact with in JavaScript and you in our browser. And then um, I find creating, especially right now with the state of, of Rust GUI toolkits, which are not super mature. And, and I, I almost always find web GUI toolkits easier to build things for quickly than native, no matter what it is, no matter whether it's, you know, native Mac or Windows or iOS, Android, whatever it is. Um, even um, I, f I find web stuff just goes faster for me for what I know. So that's why we built it in the web. Um, and we can do npm run start. And then this thing will start up a web webpack dev server and we can go here and see if it actually runs. Um, I think it's compiling all our stuff. Ooh. Okay. So yeah, we don't, we have some felt some failures here, so we'll have to, we'll have to go through and get this, uh, get this fixed here. Um, before we can actually see it. And um, I'm guessing somehow it, it uh, rendered this here, interestingly, um, already, but, um, but it's missing some stuff. So we're gonna wanna fix our, our, our basically our Webpack compile errors first um, before we move on. Um, and ba basically what it's saying here is I can't find libdmg01.js um, and I have a good idea why that might be. I think we're simply just not, we haven't compiled our Rust code into WebAssembly yet um, to expose it out uh, to to our JavaScript. So it's looking for this kind of, uh, it's looking for this module that we should have compiled our, our Rust into and it can't find it basically. Um, so if we look where that's being used, we can see here webpack config, um, Interesting. It's been a while since I've looked at this. Um, so we're, yeah, I did write it in TypeScript. That's good to know. <laughs> um, we're going through main.tsx here. We're compiling it out to dist. Um, it's able to resolve modules with those following extensions, including WASM. That's good to know. Um, okay, so I don't see anything particularly uh, WASM related there, except for the extensions thing. Let's, let's open it up in code, see what happens. It's fun debugging or looking into your code as if it's the first time, even though I wrote all this, I don't remember writing it. <laughs> so it's kind of tough. Um, so we can go in here. So this is not yet using any of our any of our stuff. Let's go into main.tsx here. I think it's probably inside of here. Yeah. Yeah, so it's looking for this libdmg01.js and it's not finding it. And the way that it's looking for it right here looks like we kind of assume that it's inside of node modules somehow. Um, but of course it's not there yet. Let's look in package JSON here. Let's see. Ah, there you go. So we have our libdmg01.js right here and it's looking in this file right here and libdmg01.js pkg. And I bet if we look there, we're not gonna find it. Uh, JS PKG and it's not there yet. So we need to go there and basically we're going to use this tool called WASM pack, um, which basically um, takes Rust code and does all the stuff for compiling it down to WebAssembly and then wrapping it in a very friendly JS package so that it can be used from, from JavaScript tooling. Um, so we can see in here, again, this is called libdmg01.js, which is kind of a misnomer because it's basically, it's all uh, 
it's all rust here. Um, and basically what we're doing is we are exposing some kind of module here called CPU with these various functions that are inside of them using our libdmg01 that we have. Um, and then exposing these through WASM Bindgen here, uh, a public interface that JavaScript can use. Um, and if you've not used uh, WASM Bindgen before, it's pretty awesome. Um, and basically it does just that. It basically uh, allows you to write very small um, attributes on your Rust code, and then it generates code for you to be able to use inside of or from JavaScript through WebAssembly. So you can see here, um, they have this greet function that they've just annotated as WASM Bindgen. And other than that, it's basically, this is all just regular Rust code. There's nothing special going on here. And then when they go through and, and compile it down, they can just import that function from their, their module there and it just works. Um, and if you don't know about how WebAssembly works, like it's pretty cool because WebAssembly doesn't understand strings at all. All WebAssembly understands is numbers. It's a very simple instruction set. And so what WASM Bindgen does is it establishes some kind of ABI between your Rust code inside of uh, WASM and the, the JavaScript. So for instance, for strings, it will basically put all the characters into memory get a pointer out to memory and then pass that pointer over through WebAssembly into JavaScript. And then um, JavaScript can hold on to this object that has a pointer. And then when it gets passed back into the, the WebAssembly Rust, it can unpack that pointer for you and turn it back into a Rust string type. Um, and that all gets done automatically for you. You as the user of this, of this library don't have to um, don't have to do anything about it. it. It all gets generated for you. Um, yeah. If you have any questions on how WASM Bindgen actually works, let me know. Um, but it's a pretty cool library. Um, yeah, so this is basically what we're going to be exposing up to, to our JavaScript here. Um, and it's basically just exposing like our our, our CPU, it's allowing us to set a register, it's allowing us to step in uh, through our, our CPU, can convert our CPU to JSON, for instance, um, so we can look at it and stuff like that. Um, that all sounds like black magic. Um, it is kind of black magic, um, except it's not because it's computers and computers are never black magic at the end of the day, right? Um, and the nice thing with WASM Bindgen is if you go here, the documentation is fantastic. Um, and they have a whole thing here on, where is it actually? Um, basically they have like a internal design. They have like a whole section here on like what this thing is actually doing. Um, I wrote a blog post as well um, on on this to kind of give like a high level overview. Um, let's see here. It's a bit old now. Um, it's, it's about five months, six months old, uh, but it explains the black magic there of how it actually works, um, and it's it's pretty simple, um, like. This is basically the code that gets generated um, by, by WASM Bindgen here. And besides the fact that it has these really long, scary names or whatever, like the code isn't that bad. Um, if you were to get rid of these long, scary names, there wouldn't be too much craziness going on. Um, and you can see like, for instance, it's converting these numbers here. These numbers that it gets back, it's converting them into the proper types. So. And it goes, the whole blog post goes through exactly how that works. Um, so, so yeah, it is black magic until it's not because you understand how it works. Um, cool. So what were we doing again? Oh yeah, what happened here? Oh, I think it, yeah. So 
this code was written before like Rust format became stable and before Rust 2018. And so all these code bases are like not formatted properly and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think if I, I think I already just formatted it basically on save because now I have it where when I save a file, it runs Rust format um, on the file. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with Rust format, basically it's, it's like a formatting tool, just like Go format that formats your code in a specific way so that all Rust code kind of has a very similar look and feel to it. Um, so that's nice. Um, yeah, let's make sure it's just on here. We can just go ahead and say, um, you know what? It's fine. We'll just commit it. On Rust format on lib. DMG01 JS. That's a very long and boring name. We should come up with something better. So, chat, if you have any ideas on better names, let me know. Um, cool. So, I've opened up way too many of these things. Um, let's see if we have a README here. No, we don't. Um, so, it would be nice to have a README on how to basically how to generate um, the the stuff. I believe. Um, if you want to run Wasm pack, which again, Wasm pack, basically it, it is a wrapper around Wasm bind gen and it compiles your Rust code to WebAssembly and it packages it up nicely into a nice JavaScript compatible package. So that JavaScript code just looks at it and goes, oh, I understand that. Um, and has no idea that it's actually Rust code behind the scenes. Um, so, and I think I probably have an old version. I imagine this is, uh, I think they're on like 0 0.8 or something like that now. Um, let's see here. But I, I don't know if I want to update quite yet because then I'm going to run into issues. Um, well, it says 0 0.6 is the, I think, we might actually be uh, on the latest version. Why don't we have? We should have a. We don't have a um, a link to their crates.io thing easily available there. But let's just run Wasm pack build and see what happens. So you can see it's like checking Rust C version, making sure everything's good there. Looking at the crate configuration, making sure everything's good there. It's adding Wasm target um, to to my Rust toolchain so that I'm able to cross compile to, to WebAssembly. And you can see here that it's up to date because I've already done that before. Um, and now it's going to compile my Rust code to, to WebAssembly. Um, and you can see here it's compiling a bunch of the uh, all my dependencies into WebAssembly, um, which will take a hot minute. Um, and then once it does that, it will package everything up into a nice, neat package. And I believe by default, it puts it into a PKG file, which is exactly what we're looking for. And it has a package.json and it and stuff like that. So um, it should work fine, I believe. So we just gotta wait for it to, to go through. Has anybody in chat used uh, WebAssembly yet? It would be cool to know what experience with WebAssembly people have. Um, it's been very interesting using WebAssembly for this kind of cross-platform nature of it so that I can write it for many, many different platforms um, and compile it down. Um, the ultimate goal of this project, I think, too, would be to get this running on like mobile phones as well. Um, and so basically you could compile Rust into, you know, code that runs on iOS, and then you would expose it out to some Swift code that would like do, you know, the basically the wrapper around it. Um, so it looks like most everybody has precisely zero WebAssembly experience, which is good. Um, it's still a pretty early technology, so um, you might run into some sharp edges, but the Rust 
the rust tooling um, is very good, um, except when it comes to compile times, as always. Um, yeah, so you can play Zelda as a bus stop, exactly. Yes. It, there is something fun about playing a video game on a machine that you built. <laughs> um, and eventually you could get this thing running on a Raspberry Pi or some kind of embedded device and you could really just have like, you could make your own case or whatever and you could basically create a Game Boy f um, from nothing um, and have your own Game Boy device. Um, that will be pretty cool, I think. Um, yeah. So this is the rough part of using Rust. If you have not compiled it before and don't get the goods of uh, like incremental compilation, the compiling from scratch takes a while. How would you manage the control on mobile? I don't know. Maybe, I think I've seen Game Boy emulators before on mobile and they usually expose, because also the aspect ratio of Game Boy screens is very different obviously than mobile screens. So your mobile screen is tall and thin, whereas a Game Boy screen is relatively square, right? So you're gonna have that screen and then underneath it you have space for controls. So you can really just kind of paint a, like a Game Boy um, there and you know I imagine that would be fine to have a B and the d-pad and you can just use it with your through touch I think that would probably be probably be fine um, oh boy still going um, yeah once once it's this gets running um, then we can go through and get, uh, oops, getting big on me. We can go through and get, uh, get our debugger running and have everything, uh, check why our tests are failing. Basically, this is ridiculous. I imagine it's taking even longer because OBS is running right now and OBS is like hogging my CPU. Um, so compiling Rust and running OBS at the same time is not a good idea, apparently. So normally it doesn't take this long. Um, question to the chat again that I wanted to ask. Does anybody have, um, I think I think one person mentioned it, but does anybody have uh, emulation experience? Some person was saying they were watching Ferris's uh, emulation streams as well, which is how I got into emulation as well. If, if you're not familiar with Ferris, um, I think on YouTube, if you go to Ferris makes demos or something like that, Ferris, Ferris stream stuff. Um, Originally, uh, Ferris um, was making a N64 emulator uh, and Rust. That project kind of died a little bit. Um, and then he switched over to doing uh, Virtual Boy. Um, and uh, that's been really interesting. So if you want to get into some real hardcore emulation, uh, N64, uh, yeah, and he's also on Twitch, yeah. Um, N64 and Virtual Boy are much more complicated machines than, uh, than uh, Game Boys are. So um, that's uh, a little bit more advanced. Um, so let's see here. Huh, why isn't Bynchen? So apparently our Waz and Bynchen backend is broken. I wonder if it's just because we have a really old version of things. Um, let's go to crates.io. Okay, cool. So we've got some got some experience doing uh, emulation in the chat. That's that's great. So let's see let's see what's the latest version of Wasm Bindgen here. Uh, two three eight is the latest version, and what do we have here? 
Um, oh, why don't I have? It's weird. Oh, there it is. Sorry, I am. I'm blind. Uh, yeah, zero two sixteen and zero two three eight. Let's just go ahead and we'll uh, we'll update that and see what happens there. Um, and hope it will compile much faster now that it doesn't have to. Ah. Hope hope is not going to make me close code. Sometimes you have to close code because like the the uh, the the thing that compiles your code inside of code to show you you know all the IntelliSense stuff will fight with the Rust compiler in your uh, in the terminal and they're basically go after some locked file one thing has a lock and it can't finish until the other thing stops trying to go yeah so it ends, ends up in that places um, so we'll see if uh, updating the wasm bind in here helped at all um, and in the meantime we can can look at how it's being used inside of dmg 01js and this is the javascript code that's basically we can look again um, at our gameboy.tsx here and see how our CPU is actually being used. I think I definitely need a faster machine if I'm gonna run, if I'm gonna do Rust streaming. OBS and, uh, and the Rust compiler are really gonna fight it out otherwise. Um, yeah, so for instance, we're gonna have a run button to run our Game Boy, and you can see in here, in run, um, and inside of run here, we're gonna call run frame, and inside of run frame, if I could get it to go there. What, why did it do that? Inside of run frame here, you can see we're doing timing just like we were doing before. Um, yeah, I hope the I hope the fan is not like making it hard to hear me. Let me know if uh, if the fan is making it hard to hear me. Um, inside of here, you can see we're calling cpu.step. And this step function here is defined by our wasm bindgen, wasm pack combo. And once we get inside of there, um, we're hitting WebAssembly then, which is pretty cool. Let's see what's going on. Oh man. Apologize again for the for the delay. We'll see see how long this takes. Um, we're definitely gonna want to take a look at uh, at timing as being a thing um, to to put inside of our library because right now basically basically what we're doing is just trying to figure out how how long we you know how long it's been since we've last run and if it's been less than the amount of time that a frame of the game boy would run we continue to run our our emulator and if not we pause um and that's it's pretty naive but uh, it gets the job done i wonder if we uh open up activity monitor what it looks like Let's see here what's oh it's struggling it is struggling it's not even showing the CPU percentages yet hilarious Oh man. All right, well, um, I'll open up to, to chat. Um, so far, has everything made sense? Is there something that you would like me to go over? Something that wasn't quite clear how it worked? Um, something you want me to go more in depth into? Um, 
now's the time since we're waiting. So what was my motivation for this project? Um, I, I sort of mentioned it a little bit before, but the main motivation, well, so I actually built a Game Boy emulator before in, in JavaScript um, and it worked and it was fine. It was a little bit unreliable and stuff like that, but it was fine. And uh, then I wanted to, write it again in Rust because I enjoy writing in Rust and I think writing an emulator in a language like Rust makes a lot of sense. For the Game Boy, it's not strictly necessary because it's such a, an old and slow machine. You can use basically any language um, for it because your computer is so much faster than the Game Boy, that's fine. But if you want to get into more advanced emulation for newer machines like the N64 or like the PlayStation 2 or something like that, or even emulating something like a modern computer or a modern um, game system, then having something like C, C++, or Rust are like your basically your only choices um, or assembly. Um, and so writing in a Rust makes a lot of sense. And, uh, and I wanted to have good documentation and basically create a, 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 a document that would explain to people how writing emulators actually works. And so the real motivation for this project is the book. Um, and you know what I can do? I can show you what the book looks like right now. Um, struggling to remember where it lives, but I think I might have a, um, and everything is slow now. So it's going to take a while even to, even to, uh, open, open the repo on GitHub. Um, yeah, it's here. Um, so here's the book, um, and basically what it is, is almost, almost everything that I've done so far, and it's, it was missing a, a few things, but almost everything that the project has so far is documented here in the book. So if you want to learn about CPU registers, for instance, you can go through here and read about it. And it really, like we write out the code. so. You can see even here, we saw that the flags register is special. Well, at first I don't explain that and I just say it's an 8-bit unsigned integer because it is. Uh, and we can go through and then we talk about the flags register and um, a little bit about how it's set up, where it's the, the, the top four bits are um, set and then the bottom four bits are always set to zero and stuff. And we go through like that. So if you're really interested in learning it, you'll learn much more from the book um, than you will from watching the stream, at least at first, um, because this is really a lot of the theory behind what's going on. Um, and we even get up, and I need to create graphics at some point, but we get up to how actually like displaying things in video works, um, how the tiling system, graphic system in, in the Game Boy works and things like that. Um, and write out the code for, for interacting with that. And this is the, the big one right here. Um, so, okay. Um, ah, so, we, so what we have right now is it's not building because we're using console error panic, um, which is a way for when, when Rust panics in WebAssembly, by default, there's no panic handling code in your WebAssembly uh, binary because that that makes the binary much larger. And so by default, you don't have that. But there's a very easy way to get nice like cont cont output when you have a when you have a panic where it will print out and say panic tier and stuff like that. So making debug a lot easier. Um, and it's just a crate, but that crate requires, or at least the old version required um, nightly, <coughs> nightly, nightly rust. 
So let's see if it still does. And I if maybe I can update it. Console error. Ah, panic. Cannot type. Hook. And we'll see if they because if it doesn't if if it doesn't require nightly, that would be amazing. You can see here that this is this is what it normally uh, is showing here. It's just unreachable. Um, and this is what it looks like when you have the, th this crate where it shows you, okay, you actually panicked because you had an index out of bounds error, for instance. Um, so that's really nice. Um, let's see. It doesn't mention nightly, interestingly. Um, and the version is now at 0 0.16. What are we using here? And of course, it would be amazing to watch it download uh, or try and compile again. Um, we can try that and then um, surprise that Wasmpack tried to build it. Can I, can I do this? Wonder if I can force it to use the nightly compiler. Oops. Let's, let's see here. Hmm. Not that I can see. Well, let's try and build it again and we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's still not. Okay, so we have to um this is an r thing is it oh it is it's us use extern macros not exactly sure why i have that there um no worries if you have to leave uh i'm gonna try and do streaming every tuesday so hopefully tuesday at around the same time um, we'll be streaming again. Um, and I imagine the next one will be probably on uh, Game Boy again. Um, although I'm not going to do Game Boy streaming every week. Um, but follow me on Twitter uh, if you want to know more. It's at Ryan underscore Levick. Um, I'll go ahead and write that now. Uh, and I'll make sure to update you. Um, yeah, no worries if you have to leave early. So, and I will be posting this to Twitter. Um, so we're gonna remove that and see uh, to, to YouTube and to Twitter. We're gonna remove what was complaining about before um, as a nightly only feature and see why we had that. Um, ah, interesting. So it looks like we have updated our, um, our code here and not our test. Which is interesting. Well, when in doubt, comment out your test, right? And we'll see what happens now. Oh, it's looking better now. Okay, so now it's installing Wasm Bind Gen. Um, and it's going to basically what Wasm Bind Gen does is it's both a library for inside of your uh, of your Rust code, but it also is a command line tool that takes we, um, WebAssembly binaries that have been compiled with Wasm Bindgen library, and it creates the JavaScript wrapper code um, that you have to have. Um, okay, and now we have package pkg, and there we go. So we have everything we need, including TypeScript um, uh, type definition files um, and I believe it should now work basically so when a JavaScript build tool like webpack looks at this it basically will just say oh this is JavaScript I know I know how this works um, and it will will build things for us so we can go back up I think to uh, dmg01 js 
um, and see if we do MPMI, oops, not IO, MPMI again. Um, everything should be fine, and then we can try and run it and see, see what happens. Um, not exactly sure why we had that um, that thing above. Um, I think what we'll probably end up doing as well is we're gonna update this thing to use Rust 2018 edition, um, just because that's just nicer to have. Um, Thanks, Frank. See you around. Um, cool. So let's see here. If we go ahead and run now npm run start. Then the hope is that this will now work and we'll see. Do, 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 compiling, compiling, no. Okay. So property new does not exist on type of CPU. Where is it complaining about this? In Game Boy TSX. So we got, we got a type error, which is, which is fine. Um, interestingly, this didn't update, but I'm gonna, gonna, uh, Open this again in code and see what happens. I would have exp this should this should be fine now. We should have like this should exist. So we shouldn't get a red squiggly here. Um, and hopefully it will tell us elsewhere in the code what's what's gone wrong. I should scoot this over for you. There we go. Okay. Yeah, so it's complaining. It doesn't know what new is. Um, which, if we look here. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, we've exposed. So what, what this does right here is say we have this new function. And if we didn't put constructor here then basically what would happen is it would be a static function on this cpu object so in javascript we would call cpu.new but because we've put constructor here it should now be kind of the the typical you know new object um, syntax from from javascript um, and i wonder if we if we look in here yeah, you can tell it has a constructor, for instance. So that's interesting that we before we're calling it as a static function, but now we now we shouldn't. Um, now it should be like this, and that compiles, and we should do the same here. So I wonder if like old the old version of uh, Waz and Bindgen wasn't doing it correctly, and now we've got this newer version that's better because they've been. They've been working a lot on it lately. Um, yeah, and this was all complaining about Game Boy TSX. So this should hopefully work now. If we go back here, have it compile again, then crossing my fingers, crossing. Ho! Okay, that's good. This is good. So if we go to change ROM here, and we can put in, let's just put in this one and change BIOS here. Um, and we wanna go back up here, put in our boot ROM and then let's run it and it's working. All right, so we've got it working in the browser now, which is great. Um, this is good. And the cool thing is it crashes. All right. Don't know why it crashes. Um, mm, interesting. So we have, uh, we have an actual panic 
um, happening now. Um, see you around. Thanks for joining. So we have a panic. Uh, we have a panic going on, unfortunately. Um, basically, caused by uh, recursive use of an uh, of an object um, here um, inside of CPU to JSON. Interesting. Um, I'm not sure why that would be and why before this worked, but I'm imagining they put in more catch, like. So this to JSON is just calling JS value. Like it's basically serializing it as, um, as JSON and returning that JS value then. And for some reason it's complaining about recursive use of an object here. Does this work yet? No, that doesn't work. Um, that's a very good question why that actually fails. Because um, apparently we're trying to, like a lot of, they, Inside of Waz and Bindgen, they try and they do a lot more borrow checking kind of at runtime because you have obviously the JavaScript uh, garbage collector and things happening there where you don't get the static guarantees. And so they have at runtime to do a lot more checking. And so something's happening, something's happening there um, when we call to JSON. The reason we're calling to JSON is when, when we open this thing here. Oh, and it works when it's not running apparently. That's interesting. So you can see here what we have. We've got uh, kind of a representation of, of the CPU. Um, we can see what the, where the program counter is. At the beginning, it's at zero. Um, we can see the stack pointer. We can see all the different registers. Uh, we can see memory here. Um, we can look at the graphics uh, here, which currently the graphics are empty. We can look at the, the actual background here. Oh, I think I, I added that late in the game there. You can see the coordinates of, uh, of things there. Um, so this is the beginning of our kind of debug uh, infrastructure here. Um, and what we're gonna wanna improve by adding things like, uh, adding things like, like setting breakpoints and stuff like that. Um, I wonder, if I hit step here, will it crash? Um, step doesn't seem to be working. Run. Huh. So something, something's not going right. Um, I think I got a bunch of errors. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, ooh. Oh, and this is a good one. So we've unwrapped a we've unwrapped a value here that was none, which we shouldn't have done, obviously. Um, so yeah, now we gotta now we gotta figure out. Um, looks like we got some. Some. Spam. Oh, okay. It's a fan noise from broadcast. Okay. Yeah, I will check that out. Um, cool. So we we basically got to figure out why we were unwrapping a um, a non value there, and let's see if we can figure out where that was. Yeah, okay, get tile buffer at. So we're basically, we've got a bunch of, of errors that we gotta go through and fix. Um, so I'm gonna try and see if we can figure out this one. And basically what it is, is we've got, we're calling this get tile buffer at thing, um, which of course we need inside of lib dmg01, let's open that up. 
some point I want to make this uh, this project work better together. These are all kind of disparate crates from each other, um, and it would be nice if they all knew about each other a little bit more. Um, you can have workspaces inside of, of things that will help. Um, cool. And the actual the actual uh, panic is coming at GPU git tile buffer add. Git, yeah. So here it is. And apparently, let's see. And this is where we're calling unwrap. Probably here, I would imagine. And for some reason, we're calling it when we don't have a background yet. Um, that's strange. Or we don't have a weird. I wonder what index was there. Because whatever tile Y is and tile X, whatever this math ends up being here, should be within the limit of whatever this background one um, whatever this background one is. So that should not have panicked. And I'm not exactly sure why. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder if we and if we run it here, it's going to work, but then it's going to, oh, then it doesn't crash. This is very strange. So we definitely got some. So here we can see everything's working as expected. We've got our tile set. We've got our background. This is all working fine. Um, if you're unfamiliar with, uh, with Game Boy, for instance, you can see here that um, if we run this as our as our background scrolls, you can see it's actually the way it works is the 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 logo doesn't come down, but rather the window, the viewport goes up and exposes the exposes the background. I always thought that was super interesting when I first learned that. Um, it is a bit a bit unfortunate right now that it's like crashing intermittently, and we don't know why. Let's see if I can re. I think we let it run through here and then opened it or paused it and then opened it. Shame. It's, it's working now. Oh well. Um, I think as we go through, we can try and see what uh, the reason why it's why it might crash at some point. But hey, we've got it working so far. Um, I don't know what we actually changed here to get it working. Um, oh yeah, we had to change it to use new. Now we updated some things. We commented out that test <laughs> as all good, pro pro uh, good programmers would do. Um, so let's go ahead and commit it now. So get DMG zero one JS working again, um, and then real quick since we're since we're already here, we can I think we can do cargo fix addition here, and this will update um, update our crate basically to use. Uh, the new edition, Rust 2018. Um, let's see what changes it made. Um, yeah, that was easy. Um, and I think, for instance, now we can, inside of here, um, we don't, we don't need this, for instance, anymore. Um, if we want to use macro use, we still have to do extern crate here. Um, but that's fine. Let me 
can just check again with it. Cargo check. Still still builds. And it does. Cool. Um, and then kink. That changed a bunch of stuff. We've formatted it now. Um, which is good. It's good to kind of stick to a format that everyone will understand. Um, update. So we're going to, I think we should just do this for all of them real quick so that they're all in the latest version. Um, if anybody has not seen uh, Rust editions before or Rust format or whatever and wants me to explain them, then let me know. I can do that. Um, to latest edition and format. Um, and we'll real quick just do that for uh, DMG. And we'll, no, we'll do it for libdmg on JS as well. Have it go through. Um, just want to check that. Interesting. Uh, so interestingly, it doesn't. In order to use, actually use the addition, you need to update your cargo.toml um, to, to do this instead. Um, and it doesn't do that for you automatically, apparently. So we're going to do that real quick. Because without that, we're actually still using the old edition, which we don't want to do. And here we go with, uh, I think, building sin is in, uh, in Serde is uh, tough on the computer. Um, but we can, this is all JavaScript, so there's no additions there that we got to worry about. And in here, we can go ahead and update it to 2018 here. I think we can. If we go in here again. Um, now that we've updated the cargo.toml to say edition is 2018, we should go ahead and run cargo check again to make sure that it still compiles with that. Um, it's another thing. I should start making some um, some issues on the repo. Um, so that we know what we need to work on and stuff as we so we don't have to always be like having it in our heads. Um, so for instance, having, um, having, having some kind of CI will be really important for us, I think, so that we don't have to constantly build it locally to make sure that everything's working and stuff like that. Ah, and there you go. We have, we have an issue here in flags register. Um, oops. Oh, man. No, it's the wrong one. It's in here. Oh, what is it meant? In here. We've updated it here, but this has to say now. So part of part of the addition change is you have to do this now. Ah, sorry, not a crate. This should work actually. Um, maybe missing extern. Yeah, but we're Rust twenty eighteen now. We don't need extern crate. That's interesting. Not sure why that's why that's failing. Oh, we're in the um, okay. That worked now. 
Oh, I think it was just going through. Um, cool. So now we just have to, we have a, uh, a variable that's mutable that doesn't need to be mutable inside of GPU. Down here. So we can go ahead and change that. Um, and with that changed, we should be good. So now we can do cargo check and everything should be fine now. Um, just to make sure here, we update it to 2018 here as well. We did, okay, cool. So update lib dmg01 js to 2018 edition. Um, actually, what we didn't run was cargo format, which we wanna do real quick. And no, not too much there. Um, actually, nothing happened. Cargo format all. Okay. Apparently, it's fine. Um, we might have already run cargo format on this before, so. Um, let's go back here. Cool. Um, I'm going to push this up. And we can go through now and make our um, make our issues real quick. Um, we'll go ahead and say add CI to project. Um, been having good luck using uh, Azure Pipelines lately and been enjoying it. Um, had a couple of projects that I've been working on move from Travis to Azure Pipelines, and it's been good. I mean, I work for I work for Microsoft, so um, that's always nice when I can use something and it feels good to use it. Um, definitely recommend it. Um, Cool. Um, yeah, so how's everybody doing? Uh, any questions so far? We're coming down to the last 30 minutes uh, of the stream. Um, so what I think we might end up trying to do real quick is probably get um, some kind of uh, some kind of breakpoint thing working, and see if that see if that's even possible um, in thirty minutes. Um, setting it up with UI might be a little bit of a stretch for thirty minutes, but we can see uh, we can see how things go. Um, so let's check out a new branch for this. Um, So basically what we want to be able to do is like click on a thing. If we click somewhere here and the program counter lands on that point in memory, we want the program counter, we want execution to stop basically. Um, so we need support for that in here inside of CPU. open and expand this out a little bit more. Um, and execution inside of CPU happens mainly in here, um, inside of inside of step slash inside of execute here. Step calls execute. Um, so when we call step, you can see we're getting a, a mutable reference to self and basically um, what we're doing uh, the, the step is in charge of stepping one kind of cycle through the CPU um, and uh, it returns back, I believe the number of cycles that has, uh, the number of actual cycles that have happened. Um, so when, when we say 
when we say cycles here, um, each instruction takes a, a number of, of cycles to actually run. So for instance, here, this increment um, instruction, um, when, uh, when the target is a 16-bit register, for instance, it takes 12 cycles. And when the target is um, anything else besides the 16-bit register and this indirect register here, it takes four cycles. So we're returning that back out here and basically we're telling the caller like, hey, we just ran and we took four cycles to run. And this is important for timing because the amount of like, we should be able to run only a, a certain amount of cycles per second because that's how the Game Boy ran. Um, our clock speed of our computer is obviously running millions and millions and millions, uh, billions actually of, of instructions per second. Um, I think this is like a 3.1 gigahertz uh, machine. So it's running billions of instructions a second um, and our Game Boy is capable of running like thousands, I think. Um, of instructions a second so we're gonna we basically have to slow down and say hey only run only run so much um cool so basically what we want to do is on our cpu we probably want to have like a um a debugger of some sort um and I'm thinking we might want to do this naively where we first just have like a um, a breakpoint um, so we can have one breakpoint maximum and then we can ex uh, eventually expand it out to have multiple breakpoints. Um, but maybe if we just do this, like where we say debugger and basically like a debugger will be an option um, of debugger and that's a struct we're going to make at some point um, and uh, basically when you create a CPU um, you're going to have no debugger and then you can attach um, you can attach a debugger to your CPU by doing pub fn um, let's say attach attach debugger and I guess this will take just a mutable reference to self um, and then call uh, self.debugger equals debugger, we'll just say new. Um, cool, I'm just going to complain because it doesn't know what the heck debugger is. That's fine, we can create that um, for now. We'll just create it here. Um, and I think the thing that we want to have is a list of breakpoints. Um, and we'll just say, for now, it's a vector of U16s. Um, because basically, like this is just going to be a, a, a list, a long vector of, of um 16 bit integers and we're gonna like look and see okay is the current program counter equal to one of these breakpoints if it is hold that execution basically um yeah that's that's basically it um cool oh, and we need to create a new function And our new function is going to take nothing and it's going to return back a debugger. Um, and that is just going to be debugger breakpoints. Like that. Um, yeah, and at some point we'll have to have we'll have to have the ability to add breakpoints to the debugger. We'll have to see should, um, oh, and it takes an option, that's fine. 
so we'll have to see how we want to um, add breakpoints if we want to expose something on the CPU to add a breakpoint or something like that we can we can see mm. yeah it's this is so slow when running OBS it's unfortunate cool um, and then I think now we basically just want to say if this is this is going to be a little bit hard to figure out exactly how to model this but basically what we want is if self debugger um, if let some debugger So if we have a debugger and the debugger dot breakpoints dot do we have is there an include? There should be a contains. No? Might be contains. Yeah. So if breakpoints contains self dot pc then then we want to do something here we want to we basically want to pause execution here um yeah that's fine okay we got to pass it in as a as a reference that's also fine um, and the question is, how do we want to model the fact? So we have we have is halted here, and a a PC or a, sorry a CPU can be in a halted state. That's something like there's an there's an instruction that you have on your on the Game Boy CPU that says halt execution, um, and uh, games will do this um, because basically it will halt execution until some external um, program interrupt happens um, and games do this a lot because uh, when you're when the CPU is in a halted state it saves a lot of battery so you can basically put the CPU into a halted state and wait for some kind of external um, stimulus to wake it back up and that's, I think that's usually either a timer or um, or you know somebody interacting with a gamepad or something like that and if you put it into a halted state it will it will use less battery power because it's not doing anything. Um, so, so that's kind of part of normal execution of the CPU. But a debugger, if we want to, if we hit a debugger, we don't want to. We don't want to say that it's halted, but rather we want to pause it and say this thing is actually not currently running. Um, and so. Yeah, we may want to change this at some point. Um, I can imagine us, for instance, having some kind of like executor or whatever that holds on to a CPU. And um, if you, you know, and it has a debugger and then it has this pause state and stuff like that. So the CPU is never in a pause state or whatever. But I think for now we can, we can just uh, have something here like um, is, is paused. Um, and this will this will indicate basically whether whether our CPU is in a pause state or or not. Um, yeah. What is it complaining about here? Cannot move out of borrowed data. Data. There we go. And then. This should turn into a reference of some sort at some point. Um, cool. So now we have a reference here, and that all works fine. So if we hit that, then we can say self dot is paused equals true. Um, and this the step function needs to return back a number of a number of cycles that have happened 
um, we might have to change that as well because now when we call step and it and no cycles have happened because we're paused how how should we indicate that right um, uh, it's almost like this step function should return something that says you know maybe it should return back uh, an enum that says okay i've executed and here are the number of cycles i've executed or i've been paused so we can change this to like um, something like step result or something like that um, not exactly sure if we want to do that but for now, I'm just going to return zero here, and we'll see. We'll see what kind of craziness happens uh, in the meantime if we do that. Um, what's complaining about now? Um, And I think up here we also need to now say if self dot pause is paused for now let's return zero. Cool. So I wonder if here if in new, if we were to say, instead of here, we'll say vec uh, 0x100. And I know uh, like the Game Boy always reaches uh, 0x100 because that's the first, the first address that gets executed after the, the ROM stops executing. If we kind of default to that, and then run this thing, what the heck will happen? Like if we run, if we run for instance, DMG01 here, cargo run. Is it just gonna spin? After it gets out of the ROM, let's see. Huh. Okay, that didn't work. Um, oh. Mm. Did it not? No, it compiled it. Um, interesting. Let's. Ah. Sorry. It's because we didn't add a debugger. Some. Debugger. Yeah. Now it's paused. Now I imagine it's going to go pretty crazy here. Well, OBS, of course, but this thing should take off. Um, the reason being is now we're just sitting there spinning, basically like being like, dude, come on. Um, so that's not a, that's not a really great way um, of working it. We, we need, because, because outside code is, is deciding how things, how things work here, we're gonna want to expose to the outside world what state we're in. Um, and any any time I hear that where I think, okay, we're gonna we're returning from this function and informing the outside world of how we want to be executed now, that just sounds all kinds of we have internal state to our CPU, namely if we're paused or not, um, and what debugger we have, and we want to then pass that out to the caller of step, and have that caller caller react somehow to it. 
Um, I'm going to, for now, I'm going to remove this. Um, and let's see if we go inside of, get rid of this, because we're not in JavaScript world anymore. And this. And now what we're going to do instead is I think we're, I want to try this. I'm going to try this out. We're going to, um, sorry. We're going to return from here instead of just a U8, we're going to return this, uh, a step result. Um, and that's going to be an enum. And the first possibility is like executed uh, eight. Um, so that's going to be the number of steps that we've executed, or it's going to be paused. So here we're going to say executed. Ugh. Why do I keep typing K and J? Step result. Um, and then, cool, we're going to do step result. Uh, paused. So this is where we're paused. And then way down here, we're going to do step result executed. All right. This should be fine um, as soon as that's done. Oh. What does it say in here? I can't leak a private type. That's cool. Just gotta make these public. And that should fix it, I believe. Come on, compile. It's very slow. All right, so now we're compiling there, which means we're not gonna compile here. This now is no longer going to be here. And that, let me verify we're only calling step here, right? Yeah. Um, so this is an interesting one um, because what we're going to do is call the CPU step here, match um, we need to appear need to bring in our, our step result. We've executed cycles, then we basically want to continue it as is. Um, 
Boah. Um, otherwise, if we've gotten back is pause, like the question is, what do we do here? Because the whole, the whole thing that we've been doing um, is we've been, we're basically looping forever. Um, I wonder if, what are we using here? We're using mini FB. I think mini FB doesn't really come with anything that um, will just like pause execution or something like that. Um, but basically we want some way of saying like, I mean, we could just sleep for a while, I guess. Um, but of course that makes, This, yeah, I think this is the C++ version, or the C version. Um, yeah, we want this one. Yeah, I mean, adding pause to our window thing doesn't really make any sense because we have no UI for unpausing. Um, but I guess what we could do is say let's go ahead and say hmm yeah I guess to get this working, we basically need to introduce some state inside of our thing here. Like run needs to know what kind of state that we currently have. Um, like we need to have here again some some state that says we're running or we're paused. Um, basically we're constantly going to be saying if the let mut state equals state running so we're going to be in running state and we're going to say if the state ever ends up being if state equals state paused, then we can sleep for a little while. Um, let's say we'll sleep from we'll sleep for a millisecond. That should be enough enough pause um, and then we can continue uh, cannot be so we need to implement partial equal here because by default they're not so derive oh, that's very annoying derive partial And that hopefully will make it run now. Um, okay, so we basically said if we're if we're paused, then we're gonna sleep and continue. Um, we want something up here that says if window dot is key down. Um, and we'll say key p if the p key is down then we're going to say we're going to toggle the state um, and we can do impl state fn eh, let's not do that if p is down 
then state is going to be match state. Paused is going to go to state running and state running is going to go to paused. Um, so this says anytime we've got the P key down, we're going to switch. This is going to be difficult because there's no debounce here, but we'll see if it works. We'll see what happens. Um, it might kind of jitter back and forth between the two. Uh, but that's fine. Um, okay, so if P is down, we're going to switch state. And if the state is paused, we're going to sleep and then continue. Um, and then basically all we need to do down here now is say, if the step result is paused, then we come and say state equals state running. Uh, paused. Um, so now we have the possibility of pausing both by at the breakpoint and by hitting P. Um, I think we we'll probably want to. See, we'll see what this gets us. So we're going to run and I'm going to hit the P key and see what happens. Nope, didn't work. Oh, did. Ha ha. Yeah, so we definitely got the debounce issue going on. Um, that, you know, we're checking basically every millisecond or so here. Um, that emulator is so cute. It is. Hello. <laughs> it's very small. I apologize for the, for the size. Um, uh, we, we basically got it where when we hit the P key, we switch states, but of course, like every millisecond we're checking here, we're checking if, key, if the P key is down. And so if we're holding it down for a long time, we're basically going to be toggling back and forth, um, which is not good. And there's ways definitely to fix that, um, but we got five minutes left, so not really, not really. Uh, we can we can handle that next time. Um, yeah. So let's see. We got my my screen disappeared though. Where did it go? So we can pause it now. I'm gonna hit P again. Nope. Got it. And if I did it again. Oh, it's frozen. Yeah, we got some issues here, but that's all right. Um, now it's just gonna be, yeah, we gotta just kill it. But we've gotten to the point, basically we know what we need to do. Um, I'm not sure if I'm fully happy with the way that we've, we've uh, modeled state and paused execution. So and we're kind of passing it around and we've got, um, I'm wondering if we should keep all of that out here. And when we call step, for instance, uh, we're basically passing in the debugger and then it can check to see whether we're hitting a, a debug breakpoint. Then um, the state is kind of all over the place. And it makes me think that we need some kind of encapsulation here. Um, also, the fact that we have timing all over the place as well is not that great. Um, it would be really nice if we had some kind of encapsulation that did execution for us and kept track of whether we're in a pause state or an executed state, does the timing math for us and things like that. Um, so I think that's what we'll, we'll work on next time. Um, I think we'll shut it down for now. Um, sorry to those who came, who came late to the party. 
Uh, but there will be a next time. Uh, like I said, I plan on um, plan on streaming every Tuesday. Um, so come back in a week. Um, we'll pick up from where we left off. This was kind of a rough introduction to how things work. Um, we just dove in and tried to figure out what to work on. Um, now I think we have a better idea of what to do. We're going to try and figure out how to add a, a debugger here and some debugging um, debugging mechanisms and stuff like that. But uh, but that should be fine. Um, and once we have debugging mechanisms in place, then we can figure out why our tests are are failing, basically, um, because without that, we're going to do, a, it's going to be a lot more hard um, to figure that out. Um, cool. Any last questions from the chat or any thoughts? Um, please let me know on either on the chat here or on Twitter um, what you thought of the stream, what you would like to hear uh, next time, what you didn't like, things like that. Um, and, uh, hopefully this is the first of many. Um, so thank you. Uh, I, I hope you all, I hope you all enjoyed. Um, yeah, with, with that, without further ado, then I think, uh, that's it for, for today. I'm going to go, go eat some dinner then. So thanks for, thanks for hanging out everybody and, uh, see you around.